Good morning, it is July 20. Yesterday I enjoyed myself so much walking on the rail trail that I'm gonna do it again today, taking off where I turned around yesterday. So I think this will be a trend for the rest of the time that I'm here in Penticton. And this section of the trail is farther away from Penticton, obviously. So here's hoping that there won't be as many people Magnificent views, as always. I didn't know railway beds went uphill, but this one is going uphill. <laughs> Not a flat walk today, but that's all right. After God had delivered the Israelites from Egypt, and after he set up the sanctuary with the Israelites, he instituted what are called the Feasts of the Lord. The feasts should actually be called appointed times because that's what they really were. As a matter of fact, in one of the feasts, there was no feasting. It was actually a fast. These were yearly feasts. I'm glad to be higher than the highway today. These feasts are also called festivals. And there were six of them, three of which required them to meet at the sanctuary, which was no problem when God instituted them, because the sanctuary was right where they camped. Later on, when they entered Canaan, they were all spread out, and so it was required that they make a pilgrimage, at least for the males. But before getting into the feast, God reminds the children of Israel of the Sabbath. That was the very first appointed time that he had set. What? There's a marmot here? That's amazing. I thought they lived way high up in the mountains. The creatures I see on the trails. Hey, you little woolly marmot. What you doing down here? Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of rest. It is a holy convocation, and you shall do no work therein, for it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Sabbath of rest literally means a Sabbath of Sabbath observance, because rest means Sabbath, or Sabbath means rest. The King James fails to convey the full force of the original Hebrew, which is variously translated as a Sabbath of deep rest, or a Sabbath of complete rest, or a perfect Sabbath, or a Sabbath of solemn rest. The Sabbath is different from all the other feasts and holy convocations because it originated at creation, whereas all the annual feasts and Sabbaths had their origin with the Jewish nation. The Sabbath of Sabbaths or solemn Sabbaths are tied with keeping the feasts rather than the weekly Sabbath. The seventh day Sabbath was made for man and so is obligation for all men forever. Ah, I've done two kilometers already. The annual feasts were made for the Jews and were ceased to be of obligation when type meant anti-type at the death of Jesus. The seventh day Sabbath is incorporated into the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which is his constitution for this world. Because it was made before sin entered, it will remain after sin is no more. On the other hand, the annual Jewish feasts were of only temporal, local, or ceremonial application, fitted to the conditions of Palestine, and were not to be made of worldwide application. So the first feast that God proclaims is the Passover, along with unleavened bread. 
For all practical purposes, it commemorates the deliverance of Israel from Egyptian bondage. But it also looked forward to Christ, our Passover, who was to be sacrificed for us. In various respects, the Passover fitly foreshadowed the crucifixion. At the crucifixion, not one bone of Jesus' body was broken, and not one bone of the Passover lamb was to be broken. The Passover lamb was to be slain on the 14th day of Abib and eaten that night. Jesus died at Passover time. The sprinkling of the blood meant a passing over in mercy, deliverance from death. So through Jesus' blood, there has been a passing over of sins committed and confessed. The Passover sacrifice was a lamb. So Jesus was the Lamb of God. The Lamb was to be without blemish. Jesus is without blemish. Its flesh was to be eaten, and likewise we are to partake of Jesus' flesh. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread are replete with gospel truth. In the slain lamb, provision was made for saving the firstborn, but the death of the lamb was a not assurance of salvation. Its blood must be struck to the doorposts. So too, Jesus on the cross made provision for everyone to be saved, but the cross in and of itself saves no one. It only made salvation available. Thus for the Christian, the atonement on the cross though sufficient and essential for all, does not save any individual until there has been an individual application of the blood. Okay, I have come to the turnaround spot. This is the parking lot that I will start from tomorrow. I haven't seen a kilometer signpost for a long time, but my phone says that I walked five kilometers. So a little bit better than yesterday. And it was a steady uphill. So it should be easier going back, right? Even if I'm walking. I miss these flowers on the way up. They're cool. What is that? Hmm. Oh, I didn't see that on the way up either. Ben's Biffy. Don't need it, but convenient. Sternwheelers went across this lake back in the day as a part of the railway system. The sprinkling of the blood was as fully important as the death of the lamb. Yet even this was not enough. The flesh must be eaten, and it must be eaten under specified conditions. And this was not enough. All leaven must be purged away. Carelessness in the least particular would be fraught with tragic results. It is one thing to be saved from death. It is another to have the means of sustaining life. The lamb was to be roasted in its entirety, and for each lamb there was to be a sufficient number of people so that all the flesh would be eaten. Nothing was to be carried out of the house, and nothing was to be left until the morning. Everything that could not be eaten was to be burned. Similarly, the Christian must assimilate completely the life of the one represented by the Lamb. This means the entire identification of the believer with Christ. It means fully accepting the character and life of Jesus. Oh, I'm being welcomed back to Penticton. The New Testament counterpart of the Passover is the Lord's Supper, the communion service. After Christ had come, there could be no more virtue in slaying the Passover lamb, which had prefigured his coming. But there would be virtue in commemorating the sacrifice of Calvary and its sustaining power. For this reason, our Lord instituted the symbolic meal of communion the purpose of which is to remind us of the provision made for our salvation upon the cross. Like its prototype, it points both backward and forward, 
We are to remember Calvary until he comes again. The Passover stood for deliverance. The unleavened bread was reminiscent of the haste in which the Israelites left Egypt. Leaven was to be entirely excluded. It represents the wickedness, malice, and false doctrines as exemplified by the teachings of the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Herodians. Paul says in Corinthians, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Well, that was the first feast, which we call Easter these days, but we'll learn about other feasts in hikes to come. And I know we've talked about this in the past, but the Bible brings it up again and I'm going through the Bible. So it'll be a refresher for some and for others, it will be new. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice for me and for anyone else who accepts your gift of salvation and will apply your blood to the doorposts of their hearts and will eat your flesh and become like you. We look forward to you redeeming us from this wicked world of bondage. So this rail trail that I've been doing is called the Penticton to Naramata Trail. Yesterday I did the first leg, today I've done the second leg, which was kilometer four to kilometer nine. And I would give it a three out of five. It wasn't near as spectacular as yesterday's was. However, the people factor was quite a bit less. More cyclists on this section than walkers, but still heaps less than yesterday. And it was uphill the whole way, and of course downhill the way back. It was fine, I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I'm doing this. There's lots of sumacs bordering this pathway today. And they are nice in their place, but I know they can be invasive as well but along the pathway is very nice. Jesus saves. What is preventing you from giving your life to him?